Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I begin my contribution to the debate on the national um, budget 2020, may I add my congratulations to the Deputy Speaker, one of the very first Amerindian to attain such a position. I also want to wish him um, the very best in the position. Mr. Speaker, I also wish to add to the compliments for the work that the Ministry of Finance, including all those who would have contributed to ensuring that in record time, the budget 2020 is before this house. Our plan for prosperity is a strong signal which expresses the commitment of the PPP civic government to ensure that Guyana is once more a prosperous nation. This, Mr. Speaker, is attainable. I say so because the track record of the People's Progressive Party Civic over the period that they've served this nation has provided enough evidence that we are capable to ensuring that Guyana gets back on track. Mr. Speaker, I say so because recalling when we were not in government on two occasions, for example, in 1992, we found Guyana's treasury empty and without haste, within a decade, there was a serious turnaround in all sectors. And since then, Guyana has become a very progressive country. And in fact, I recall that even in 2013, when many countries were facing economic and financial crises, Guyana's head was above water. And so therefore, I wish to posit that as we are back in office after five years where our economy was decimated, where the structures with relation to our economic structures, social, and even our people, it was a disastrous five years. And I can commit to this nation that the People's Progressive Party Civic will once more ensure that our people are taken out of such distress. And we've seen it happening already, even before we can place a budget in this house. The hope of Guyanese people began to rise. Even the businesses, I've had discussion with small business. I've had discussion only recently with Amerindian youths. And they themselves have told me very recently, only a week ago, that they are expecting and they are hopeful that what they have seen in such a short time, they are now optimistic that the opportunities that will come their way is going to be realized. Mr. Speaker, those young Amerindian youths also gave me some guidance with respect to what they expect of this government and how they intend to proceed in partnership with the ministry and the government. And that, is, that was very heartening. That was a very important message coming from the young people because we have seen how the youths have been ignored in the last five years. I myself, not very young, but energetic still, I have seen the disappointment in the youths. You look around at the leadership level in the parliament in the last five years, 
it was only on our side. And I always point out to the Member of Parliament from Linden, you're the only standing youth in that period. Mr. Speaker, the youths were disappointed. Their entire five years was turned over in less than no time. So Mr. Speaker, I want to say, I want to answer to the call of the Honorable Member, Ms. Dawn Hastings, former minister. She called for inclusiveness. She called for this government not to practice discrimination. I want to assure the Honorable Member that the PDP civic government is the one that have built social cohesion in this country. It is the People's Progressive Party Civic that have ensured that harmony lasted for a while until the APNU took over in 2015. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Honorable Member that it was in 2018 that the entire country began to slide because they showed their true colors after the no confidence motion was passed and they were expected as a responsible government, as a government that cared for this nation or should have cared for this nation to have done the right thing. What did we see? We saw the disrespect they paid to our constitution. We saw the disrespect and the disregard to the rule of law. And therefore, I say to the honorable member that memories are something that live within us for a long time. And it's only a few years, and it seems as though they have forgotten what they themselves were party to when they were in government. So following in the footsteps of the APNU, AFC coalition government, is not what I want for this country. It is not what I want for the young people of this country. It is not what I want for the women of this country. It is not what I want for the Amerindians in this country. Mr. Speaker, if a government can be so resolute to disregard law and order, it sends a strong message to this nation that they don't care about people because it was because of the act and the position that they took that Guyana began to slide even further, that it took support internationally to force them to recognize their wrongdoings. Mr. Speaker, the member also, the honorable member also indicated that the PPP Civic Honorable Foreign Affairs Minister was foreign to many things in this country. She was, he was foreign to everything that was happening around. But I want to posit, whether he's, he's not in tune, I want to tell you that the PPP Civic Party, which now sits in government, made a very correct choice in the Minister for Foreign Affairs, which we now have because we would not have gone in a similar fashion to follow what the APNU AFC did. It was a total embarrassment to Guyana when the last or the, the latest foreign, the outgoing foreign minister insulted the international community. They ensured that developed countries small developing countries, our Caribbean members from CARICOM looked on with big disappointment as they consider and whisper about where Guyana was going. In fact, at one point in time, they forgot that they were whispering. And what they did was to come out with very bold statement 
against the atrocities that were being committed on the people of this country with respect to law and order and democracy. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I have a long list of responses, but I want to skip out of responding to them, and if I have time, in my last five minutes, I will get back to that, to the responses. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the budget was crafted in a very serious situation, that of COVID-19. Here again, I wish to say to this Honorable House that COVID arrived in this country in early February, March. Mr. Speaker, from March to August, there was nothing that the AFC did to contain this virus. In fact, they even had the hardest time to even solicit $5 million from the World Bank. And yet they can sit on that side and accuse us of spiking, spiking the rates. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind them on the other side that the former Minister of Health held testing kits in her personal space, Mr. Speaker, had to screen everyone who was suspect to having COVID-19 or the virus. And until she did not give the permission for a test, the Guyanese nation was held a bay. Mr. Speaker, now when it bears, Mr. Speaker, now because the PPP civic government was able to negotiate funding, was able to no negotiate donations of testing kits and materials to help to stem the transition, we are still being accused of not having done anything. I agree. I agree that it appears as though that the rates are rising. But as my colleagues before have already said, is that the rates are increasing. It's because we have been doing the testing. I am told that there are approximately 200 and more tests being done daily now. How much did the APNU AFC done when COVID was discovered? In fact, they didn't even have enough, enough testing kits to test themselves, that they arrived all over the place trying to justify that it was not an issue. But it was an issue because now we are discovering the extent of the infection in this nation. And we have a responsibility as a government, as a PPP civic government, not only to contain transmission, but we have the responsibility to support and provide relief to all the families and villages that are affected. And we have begun to do that. Mr. Speaker, there, are, there were calls prior to the PPP Civic taking office in August for support, but none was forthcoming. In fact, there were 1,000, I think 1,000 or a little bit more than 1,000 um, hampers that were provided to families, affected families. And that was one of the biggest criticism. Mr. Speaker, even when we, the PPP Civic, was not sitting in the seat or in the driving seat, as my honorable member said, we were out there in the fields addressing the families that were suffering. Mr. Speaker, 
we we began the mass stop campaign when a government who's claiming to be very astute, efficient, comrade, Mr. Speaker, sorry, Mr. Speaker, they could not even provide masks to this to the city. They haven't done it, but now they expect it to be done in record time. Well, I will tell you that while we were in opposition, we were masking this nation up. Now that we're in government, we will further provide further mask and ensure that we care, care for our people. Mr. Speaker, I want to also say that the man, our, our budget is replete with our commitments to the people. The commitments that we have made is very present. It is, an, it is evidence in the budget. And therefore, this is a different approach than the APNU approach. Because if I can recall that in their first 100 days in office, they did not even accomplish those commitments or promises made. And in the fifth year, they still were not accomplishing what they said they will do. And in fact, they criticized the manifesto that we have. But I want to remind them that they did not take a manifesto to the people during the elections. Their manifesto remains a blank document. So, Mr. Speaker, I will not compare the PPP Civic, or neither, neither would I wish to take the guidance or wish that our leaders take the guidance that we should copy or follow what APNU AFC has done. Because I can tell you that all the projects that they are claiming credit for were projects initiated by the PPP Civic Government, including securing and committed funds, committing funds to those projects. And I can tell them now that many of the projects that they took over that were in progress, it took them five years to even reach a 50 to 70 percent completion. And I can reel it out on my hands. The East Coast Road, the PMP project that took them five years and still have not completed it. The airport, PVP project, money is committed, they have not rolled it out. West Dam Road, the PVP project, committed, money is committed. And therefore, there are still complaints on the road. Mr. Speaker, the failure to complete ongoing projects where there was no need for looking or sourcing financing for those projects, which would have taken away some of the time and give you an excuse, but there's no excuse for not completing those projects. Mr. Speaker, looking at the indigenous development. Mr. Speaker, I want to posit here today that the Amerindian Act of 2006 does not limit Amerindians, indigenous, to say what they want to call themselves by. You can call yourself Amerindians, you can call yourself indigenous, you can call yourself first people, you can call yourself aboriginals, you can even call yourself by the nation that you come from. And that you must know, because it seems as though 
you are fighting over terminology instead of representing the people and fighting to eradicate the challenges faced by Amerindians or, as you would want to say, indigenous. I have no problem with that. It is used interchangeably. So don't make a petty matter a national matter. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to respond to this matter of youth development, his CSOs, because it has become very convoluted to the members on the other side, the honorable members on the other side. Mr. Speaker, I've heard all manner of criticism about the project, the CSOs, that they were political young people running around with red shirts. In the past, I've heard that it was a red brigade. In the past, I heard that it was the Honorable Minister who selected these youths. I've heard that these youths were providing service that were not comparable to others. Mr. Speaker, I want to sort this matter out once and for all. I would like to say that I've seen former ministers waving a piece of paper and saying that it was the PPP Civic that dismissed the CSO. I also heard an honorable member of parliament from Region 9 say that it was the PPP Civic who canceled the check. But, Mr. Speaker, if you can't understand, you can't read, you don't do your research, you will be hooked by the nose and pulled down into the mud. And I want to say this to this, nas to this National Assembly today, to this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, when we left office in 2015, it was in March. It was in March. Yes, it was in March. In fact, the PS and myself received a message that we should not turn up to the office because they have set upon us security forces with guns. That was the message we received, that we were not to enter. Well, I know that when you're no longer in government, you can't go into your office but you can go to the ministry to make representation on behalf of the constituency which you represent. But the message was clear. Mr. Speaker, when we left office, there was a cabinet decision that was passed on March the 18th, which clearly, clearly outlined that January to April, salaries for the CSO was approved. The process, Mr. Speaker, was that every quarter payments were prepared and made. Then the new government took over. Mr. Speaker, the new government under a, under a new minister had no sympathy for the Amerindian youths. Imagine they took no concern over the CSOs. They allowed them to work from March to June and refused to pay them. June, I have the records now and I can waive the records because I have the cabinet document and I have the internal memo from the officers who wrote in May, 27th of May, asking the Honorable Minister to pay the CSOs, including attaching the, including attaching this cabinet memo or cabinet decision, which was approved for them to be paid. I want to tell this House today that in May, the PPP Civic was not sitting in the seat 
of power. They were in power. In, Mr. Speak, in May, they were in power. So they should have paid it. And I can see the signature of two officers, one sitting in here and one who was dismissed, who was sent home because he happened not to be to the liking of the new government. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I would like for once and for all to say, we were not sitting there. Mr. Speaker, they never prepared the check. They never prepared the check. And the blame for that non-preparation of the check was squarely, or should squarely be placed on the AP and U AFC. In fact, they did not only Jew them for April, but they allowed those young people to work until June and disconnected them without three months of payment. Mr. Speaker, I want to say to this National House that Budget 2020 is going to provide for the reinstatement of the CSOs. And in the initial phase of this program, in the remaining quarter of the year, we will ensure that a, max, a minimum of 40 communities get on board in this very initial stage. Realistically, this is what can be accomplished. And therefore, the budget provides in excess of six to $8.4 million to allow this to happen. <clears throat> this means that $68.4 million will be circulating in the pockets and in the village that so badly needs an injection of cash. Mr. Speaker, school uniform assistance. This is something, if a government can take away support from students, it's a government that has proven that they are anti-students or they are against supporting students. Mr. Speaker, every year, for the last five years, the APNU AFC government received a budget of $89.4 million for school uniform. And this should be investigated because I have asked the office to provide me with the numbers so that I will be able to represent clearly how the APNU AFC cheated the children of the hinterland. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in 2017, 89.4 million was budgeted. Do you know how much that the AFC, APNU government was able to expend? $39 million. Imagine, you can't even procure, you can't even get an early award, and you can't even distribute uniform in the year that you are provided with a provision to do so. Is that efficiency? Is that doing the right thing? I said no, it's total failure. Total failure to just buy and procure uniform following the correct process and you still can't get it done within the year. In 2018, Mr. Speaker, they got the same amount. And guess how much they were ex able to expend? They only use $14.92 million. Not spend out everything. You wouldn't like me to expose you. Mr. Speaker, 
$14.9 million was spent. Mr. Speaker, in 2019, they received the same amount. Do you know how much they spent? $3.789 million. A government, a ministry with two ministers who claim to love Amerindians, who claim to want to support their development, who claim to want to ensure that they benefit from the natural resource and the financial resource and everything from this country. And there you sitting it with on your chairs and not even worrying whether the children were being provided with school uniforms. Mr. Minister, Speaker. Honorable Minister, you have spent all of your time. You will need an extension to continue and conclude. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask that my honorable colleague is able to be given five minutes more to conclude our presentation. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Minister, you may continue. Mr. Speaker, we've heard a lot about ICT, but I want to say that the budget provides for us to reinstate the correct concept to this program, and we want to ensure and assure this House that the PPP civic government is going to bring the real program to this country and to the indigenous people or the Amerindian people of this land. Mr. Speaker, currently we are in a pandemic. Many of the lofty um, facts or lofty untruths that we've heard in this House about the ICT, it's not working. My colleague has, has a lot of issues we're trying to get teaching material to the hinterland through the internet by the use of the Wi-Fi that you've put in. It's not working. In fact, some villages can't even use it because they don't have the computers, they don't have smartphones, and only when visitors pass by with those type of equipment is it used. So I don't know what you were thinking when you reinvented a different concept than what was supposed to be. On the, in the budget, Mr. Speaker, we will be providing additional support to ensure that the hubs that were supposed to facilitate the equipment, the computers, etc., will be furnished and refurbished because many of them have been abundant and used for different purposes. So we have to prepare for them. Mr. Speaker, farmers, Indigenous and Amerindian farmers, Mr. Speaker, have had the worst treatment in a long, long time. Mr. Speaker, the government, APNU, AFC, has stopped providing for agricultural support to farmers in the hinterland. In fact, there's no more free FASTA, no more free um, Akushi Ants bait, no more tools, in, and therefore the budget intends to ensure that there's full support for the farmers in the hinterland so that they will be able in the long term to stem any disaster as it relates to food security. They'll be able in the long term to ensure that their food security is guaranteed. Mr. Speaker, with respect to presidential grants, in this budget, we provide it 280 million, and this is an increase. The AFC, the APNU AFC government took five years, sat there five years, and never one day thought that they should increase the grant fund for the villages. So in this budget, we intend to provide an increase so that further circulation of investment fund is injected into the village economy. Mr. Speaker, land titling. Quickly, I've heard a lot about land titling, but I want to report to this House that that was a disaster under the last government. A disaster so much so that the former minister reported when he was pressured into answering to why there was a pause or why there was nothing happening he admitted that within the five years that he had spent, not, he was unable to even title one 
land or one piece of land to the Amerindians. A shame. The haste. Mr. Speaker, they always seem to want to justify haste being a success. But when I got into that office, what happened? I asked for an update in Hay to Hayes. I was told that the first cohort for Hayes had 70% failure. The second cohort, which is the second phase, but they're calling it cohort, Mr. Speaker, they said they only realized a little bit, a little over 50% success. So I rest my case as it relates with Hayes. Mr. Speaker, they have been unable to support youths as it relates to training. Mr. Speaker, in terms of um, my responses, I said that I would keep some of the responses for the last in case I run out of time. But I want to say that with the housing project, that is the low income housing project, which they've asked us to continue. They, and the way it was presented, it was presented as though it's an APNU AFC initiative. That housing project, Mr. Mr. Speaker, began under the PPP Civic Government. And we intend to continue it when new and fresh negotiations will take place. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the land management courses, again, it's not a novel initiative. Land management was done in collaboration with the University of the West Indies. You know when you go into office and you want to disregard the successes of someone or an institution or a government, you turn your back or your eyes away from what had been occurring previously. So that is exactly what has just been said in this house, that this novel idea of land management all started on the APNU. It didn't. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the Green State, the Green State, Mr. Speaker, has never been adopted. And well, member, I'm afraid formalized. you have to wind down. In fact, there is nothing such as a, a Green State. What we have seen over the past five years is the greening of buildings. Everywhere you go, they have used up the Green State money to green the buildings. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. And I ask that this budget be provided with the full support of this House. Thank you, Honorable Minister.